Thank you for joining us for the Vegetative Windbreaks for Poultry Farms presentation. My name is Gary Wyatt, Extension Educator with the University of Minnesota Extension in our agroforestry and forestry teams. I also work with invasive species and bioenergy. So windbreaks is part of an agroforestry practice, uh, certainly uh, done in most parts of the world, and uh, we're studying windbreaks around poultry barns. Benefits of windbreaks can be numerous. Uh, wind modification, erosion reduction, plant protection, uh, pesticide drift reduction, irrigation efficiencies, livestock protection, odor modification or, or mitigation, and obviously uh, carbon sequestration as well. So in 2015 in Minnesota, we lost 9 million birds, uh, both from commercial and domestic poultry flocks. Uh, the birds were killed by the flu, avian flu itself, or were euthanized to prevent the spread of the disease. Thousands of birds uh, can die in a few days of this disease. So here's a map of Minnesota and where the infected counties were uh, and the number of deaths by county. So this is a slide from some of our poultry specialists uh, that they're thinking that usually this disease is spread by waterfowl, but they're thinking that in Minnesota during this period of 2015 in April, they're suggesting that there might have been some aspects of the disease that were airborne and were transmitted by the winds, carrying some types of either of dust or fecal material, feed dust, bedding, uh, those types of particles or par particulates that could be carried by the wind. So that's one of the objectives of this study is looking at the wind breaks uh, and how they might be uh, beneficial or even uh, possibly detrimental to uh, poultry barns in the Minnesota. So our hypothesis or questions evaluating wind breaks is twofold. One, uh, using min wind mitigation, uh, are poultry barns protected by the wind with wind breaks? Uh, airborne particulates, like we mentioned, we're going to do a particulate test, and then also farmer interviews. There was some farmers that suggested that they were protected by the wind breaks that they had on their farm or that were on the farm of infected farms causing a chimney effect. So that's one of the reasons why we're looking at wind breaks. Also, number two, uh, do waterfowl use wind breaks? And then what wild animals, or wild birds, mammals, and so forth are found near poultry barns and using a trail cam system? So some of the grants and tasks and, and, and results uh, we're going to talk about include the following. So we did a literature review with some of our graduate students. We had 45 documents uh, researched and we're looking at uh, journal articles and so forth with that material. Also, we surve surveyed turkey growers, 24, surveyed the Soil Water Conservation District and Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, staff in those counties that harbor birds and, and farms as well at 27. We are identifying best trees and shrubs from the surveys and plus other information around the state. We're evaluating wild bird and wildlife activity around the turkey barns with the trail cams that we have in the study. And then we're going to develop fact sheets and videos of these presentations for educational outreach to the growers. So we, we selected five, excuse me, four farms that actually were volunteers that wanted to be studied on, in this study. We also have five cameras, trail cams at each site to evaluate the animals and wild waterfowl that might be coming onto these farms and then other wildlife. Uh, so we have a, these cams at various locations, the field edge, the side of the barn, the roof line, side of the barn, uh, other side of the barn actually, and then feed bins. These are some of our farms that we have mapped out uh, from Google Earth and, and these are the positions of those trail cams. Here's our third farm. And obviously this is next to a, a river or a stream and uh, not, not necessarily a planted windbreak, but we're looking at the windbreaks and the wildlife coming off that uh, particular environment. And then this is a, our fourth farm that is along a highway and a trail system that has a windbreak along the trail system. I've got a few slides that I want to show uh, of the locations of these trail cams. Here's a, uh, Kevin uh, is our graduate student that helped with the northern uh, sites uh, to monitor those. Uh, this is obviously a trail cam facing the feed bin. We had to check these trail cams about every three weeks. We started in May of last year, 2017, and ended up in, in November. And we monitored them uh, with an SD card. Uh, we changed the batteries about every three weeks and obviously changed the SD card located on the uh, far left of the bottom of the door there of the trail cam. 
Here's a position that's outside the windbreak, uh, looking at a cornfield actually, and then a, a, a view of uh, another farm that's, uh, that's nearby. Same, same owner of that farm. And then this is a trail cam, uh, obviously looking at that same scene, looking at the trail cam. All of these sites are biosecure and they don't allow visitors. Uh, we did get permission from the owners to go on their place with protective gear and biosecurity uh, garments uh, and, and gloves and so forth to uh, monitor the trail cams. Here's another site uh, that's a feed bin site. Yeah, we did look at roof lines. So this particular camera is looking at the roof line. This is looking at the uh, site that doesn't have a windbreak. It actually has a vegetative growth there for haying and, and grazing. It's actually being hayed uh, is that site. It's not grazed, it's hayed. And then uh, looking at wildlife, and you see the turkeys there in the barn. Another uh, inside view of the, the uh, premise of the barn facilities there, uh, looking alongside the barn. Then we have one that's uh, on this particular site. There's a windbreaker farm site that's to the east of the barn facility. And we wanted to monitor any of the wildlife movement or waterfowl that might be coming into the area there. So here's some, some night pictures and some day pictures that we've captured with the cameras. Uh, we have uh, Blaze Video is the company that we went with. We did test uh, three cameras uh, and it's surprising. If you do any trail cam work, I urge you to buy three cameras of the of your choice that you think is good and then put them on site and monitor them and see which one's the best one. We, we actually purchased this one. We didn't think it was the brand name, but it was the best camera around and we, we uh, have Blaze video as uh, our cameras here. There's a possum obviously at uh, nighttime or evening time. And I think that might be a mink or weasel possibly there. There's a deer in the daytime. Uh, some wild birds, and then in same, at that same site, we found some uh, actually commercial birds that got out of the uh, facility and uh, roaming around the area, which was interesting. Another site, uh, near, this is near the trail system, uh, catching a robin, and then uh, we had the other camera right across from it, basically probably catching that same robin that day. So we talk about windbreaks really quickly. Uh, we usually, what happens is, is the plan is uh, to plant a shrub row on the very outside, north or west of your property or the protected area. And then you have deciduous trees. You could have conifer trees as in this slide, uh, but uh, it, it's kind of interchangeable. But usually what will happen, the snow will drift if you're in a snow area, uh, then uh, the snow will drift right after the first row, whatever that might be of shrubs or whatever. So in this particular case, we want deciduous trees uh, versus the, the spruce here that's planted. Because if it drops, snow drops on the spruce, then that's going to be a problem with the limbs and might be breakage and so forth. So there's different styles and different designs that you can do. Uh, and you can talk to your uh, Soil Water Conservation District office about that. So it, what's interesting is most people don't think about wind flow. Uh, so we're, we're analyzing wind flow around these barns. Uh, we're thinking that particulates might be carried by another barn uh, and, and flow over the uh, next barn, neighboring barn. So that's where the 10H or 10 to 20H uh, leeward side is protected. So the higher the, the structure, like, like the 40 foot tree would protect an area of 10 times that height. So about 400 feet uh, would be the protected area. And uh, then you've got a little bit of a windward side uh, protection as well. And then a lot of people don't look at the up the uh, kind of a downward or up uh, vertical uh, shot or a above ground shot or a, like a like a drone shot of these windbreaks. So there is a wraparound effect that you need to understand. So uh, that's kind of the science about some of the windbreaks. Just a little bit of time on this, uh, just showing you the snow catch and and uh, mainly the snow catch on these things, but on these particular examples of plantings, but uh, also affects the wind, and uh, that's what we're studying more more than the snow catch area. Porosity and, and uh, density of these plantings vary with the season. Obviously, you have deciduous trees that lose their leaves in the wintertime in the northern parts of the, of the country and the states. Uh, obviously, conifers keep their needles and, and foliage on all winter. So it really is dependent on wind flow uh, throughout the year of these particular plantings. So results so far, uh, we did an excellent literature review with some of our graduate students. We had 45 documents, uh, and we're looking at submitting journal articles with that. 
Uh, we're evaluating, we're continuing to evaluate the, the uh, uh, photographs from the trail cams in 2017. We virtually had, of these four farms and five cameras at each farm, we had over 2 million photographs taken. So it's just phenomenal data. Uh, we had the camera set at one minute and taking three shots at every minute. Uh, of movement and uh, obviously we have some outliers some some photographs that don't have anything in it maybe a moving leaf or a moving limb or a moving grass but uh, at least it gives, it gives us a lot of data to look at so thousands of photos have been screened already uh, many wildlife is being documented uh, not many waterfowl is being picked up yet so most common types of animals are deer rabbits possums various birds uh, feral cats coyotes uh, raccoons and foxes the biggest thing that we're finding out so far is the mortality composters uh, that are attracted to these composting sites that are near the barns, uh, usually possums and raccoons and crows occasionally. So here's some of the researchers coming up with on this. So one site, the mortality composters, images of, of possums and raccoons, average images over a 24 hour period is like 42 uh, time period. After that area uh, was cleaned out, the average dropped to 1.1 or 1.4 images per 24 hours. So uh, we think that that could feed domestic, uh, obviously you're feeding domestic poultry in those areas. Uh, also various wild birds are seen high, as high risk wildlife for potential and possible avian flu transmission, transmission and potentially other avian diseases such as foul uh, cholera. So that's a, a kind of a concern that uh, these mortality sites might be looked at in the future as, as a, a, a different design on these mortality sites that would not harbor disease carrying rodents and, and uh, wildlife. So it needs to be done. Obviously, we still need to do some survey work uh, and documentation of the surveys that have already been done, make some fact sheets for the growers on that. We do need to identify the best trees and shrubs available uh, in Minnesota to plant for these particular windbreaks. Um, that hopefully, there's not any too negative aspects of windbreaks, but there could be. Uh, we're just continuing to screen the trail cam photos, the farmer interviews that are regarding windbreaks. There were some farmers that suggested that uh, windbreaks actually prevented uh, the disease from either spreading to neighbors or uh, inhabiting the, themselves, uh, protected their own sites, uh, building sites of poultry barns and so forth. And we need to continue to develop some fact sheets and videos regarding this study. So we do have a website, our, our agroforestry website. It's just an extension dot umn.edu and then at slash agroforestry. You can look up uh, University of Minnesota Extension under agroforestry. Uh, there's a National Agroforestry Center that you can find out more information about windbreaks. And some of this wildlife study may be on those sites as well, but um, our particular study is not yet. And if you have any questions, Eli will be there to answer some questions. And uh, there is my contact information and also our website at the University of Minnesota Extension. Thank you for joining us here today for this presentation.